What's up, everybody? I'm Dr. Jordan Taylor, the undergraduate exercise science program director and associate teaching professor at the University of Kansas. I have a special guest on the show today, but before I introduce him, I want to briefly talk about ligaments. Ligaments are a type of connective tissue that connect bones to other bones. Ligaments are formed from an inelastic protein known as collagen, but they also contain a more elastic protein called elastin. These proteins that comprise ligaments allow for a balance between stabilizing a joint and permitting some stretch and mobility. Since ligaments connect bones to bones, they provide static stability to joints and provide additional support against abnormal movement or joint opening. One very important ligament in the knee is the anterior cruciate ligament, more commonly referred to as the ACL. The ACL is critical in maintaining anterior and rotary stability of the knee. Let's briefly discuss knee joint anatomy and take a look at where the ACL is located so you can gain a better understanding of its structure and function. The figure you see here on the screen is looking at an anterior view of the right knee. As you see at the bottom there, the patella has been removed, so the patella is the kneecap. And there in that red box, right in the middle, uh, you see the anterior cruciate ligament. So the anterior cruciate ligament and behind it, uh, just posterior, is the posterior cruciate ligament. Those two ligaments are deep inside the knee and they form an X. Our conversation, focus of our conversation today is going to be on the ACL and, and specifically ACL injuries. There's some other important structures there within the knee. You can see the lateral and medial meniscus. These are two C-shaped fibrocartilage discs that provide some cushioning between the femur, which is the thigh bone on top of the knee joint, and the tibia, which is the larger shin bone uh, that's, that's below the, the knee. And then you see on the medial aspect or the, the inner part of the leg outside the joint, you have some other important ligaments like the medial collateral ligament, also called the tibial collateral ligament, less commonly I would say. And then on the lateral aspect of the knee, they're attached to the, the fibula, the other lower leg bone, you can see the lateral collateral ligament or the fibular collateral ligament. And again, these ligaments just provide some uh, static stability to the knee, prevent, um, as you'll see with the ACL and we get into our discussion, the ACL specifically prevents um, anterior or forward translation of the tibia. Medial uh, collateral ligament prevents opening of the knee uh, towards the midline. Lateral collateral prevents opening of the knee uh, laterally. And the PCL helps to prevent posterior or backward translation of the tibia. So a lot of important roles there that the different ligaments uh, play. So now that you have a better understanding of knee joint anatomy and the ACL in particular, I want to introduce Dr. Dan Lorenz. Dr. Lorenz is currently the Director of Sports Medicine at Lawrence Memorial Hospital, Lawrence Memorial Health, Ortho, Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas. Previously, he was an owner and director of physical therapy for specialists in sports and orthopedic rehabilitation, an outpatient physical therapy practice based in Overland Park, Kansas, with three locations. He earned a bachelor's degree in health science with an emphasis in athletic training from Grand Valley State University in 1999, and a master's degree in physical therapy from Grand Valley State in 2001. In 1997, he was an athletic training intern for the Chicago White Sox Major League Baseball team. From 2004 to 2005, he completed the Duke University Sports Physical Therapy Fellowship. Formerly, he was an assistant athletic trainer and physical therapist for the Kansas City Chiefs from 2005 to 2007. And in 2009, he earned his Doctor of Physical Therapy degree from the University of St. Augustine in St. Augustine, Florida. He has served as a rehabilitation consultant for numerous local sports teams, including Sporting Kansas City, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Kansas City Mavericks, and also many local colleges, including Mid-American Nazarene University and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's the former chair of the Sports Performance Enhancement Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy. And in 2018, Dr. Lorenz was recognized by the National Strength and Conditioning Association as the Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation Professional of the Year. He has been published several times in peer-reviewed journals and has been invited as a speaker to numerous, numerous times at local state and national conferences in sports medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lorenz. Good to be here, Dr. Taylor. Thanks for having me, and that's a mouthful. I yeah, appreciate that, the introduction. That was, did I miss anything in oh, that? I, I mean, plenty. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Dr. Dan the Man Lorenz. <laughs> All right. You added that. Right. right to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got a lot to chat about. Um, so I guess we'll just start off this with the first question. Um, can you explain what causes ACL sprains and tears and why the ligament is so frequently injured in athletes? And then just kind of talk about the mechanisms of injury. Well, with the reasons why ACLs tear is uh, something that we're, we're learning more about. And it seems like the more we know, the less we know. Um, it's, there's been a lot of things that have been correlated to ACL injury, hip weakness. Uh, there's some things that we'll talk about here shortly, I think, that will uh, highlight why ACLs might be injured. But uh, typically, uh, ACLs, are it's a high-speed injury, usually a deceleration type of injury from a cut or a jump or a, a pivot um, most of the time, it's a uh, uh, an unplanned uh, movement. Uh, typically, what we you know, a lot of times we see in many sports that are rehearsed, like dancing, gymnastics, and things like that. They do tear their ACLs, but the rates are a little bit lower because they're pre-planned movements that have been practiced a lot of times. Right. Many times on the fields of play, whether it's soccer, basketball, football, uh, it's an unplanned right. change of direction or something like that that occurs. A reaction uh, to a yeah, stimulus. Reaction to, yeah, the athlete yeah. wasn't prepared for. There has been some literature overseas on soccer players that um, that there was a perturbation, like they were bumped into or pushed or hit before uh, the tear. But also, too, that they've shown in some soccer literature that it's uh, defensive movements often are, are the reason why. Uh, we typically look at a mechanism. Uh, it's called dynamic valgus. It's where the the knee kind of collapses inward. It, it's a, uh, a really good way to say it. I heard once was a mnemonic. It's called varum. So valgus, which is a kind of a, a buckling of the knee inward, rotation and out of control movement. And that's typically what's what we see in, in many of these mechanisms. Yeah, and and primarily, I think it's something like what seventy to eighty percent of ACL injuries are non-contact. That's been pretty consistent across the years in the literature. About seventy-five percent are non-contact, and, and about twenty-five percent are obviously contact. So um, that that begs the question: Then, can we do anything about it? We right. can't do much about when somebody dives into your leg and your knee buckles inward, but can we do anything about right. the? Uh, and that's really the million-dollar question: Can we do something about it? And it reminds me of recently this this past NFL season, uh, well, twenty twenty-two. Tyler Murray, the, the starting quarterback for the uh, Arizona Cardinals, um, I think it was sometime in December, if I remember correctly, but he went down uh, with an ACL injury. It was non-contact, we just talked about. And I remember he was scrambling, running to the right, was reacting to a defender. Again, reactionary stimulus. He had to make a quick cut, and you immediately saw him collapse and go down. And if you watch that injury in super slow motion, you really slow it down and look at the, the right knee, you can literally see, you can see it, the, the, the tibia translates forward. Again, that valgus stress, the knee is collapsing in, there's some internal rotation, the knee, pretty classic mechanism of ACL injury. Um, and I know, um, you know, it's just amazing it doesn't happen more often because it's like I talk about in, in my biomechanics classes, you know, if you're, if you're sprinting, and this is getting into Newton's laws, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you're putting force into the ground. The ground's putting force back up through your body. It's ground reaction force. And depending on how fast you're running, how aggressive you're cutting, those ground reaction forces could be four, five, six times your body weight. And it's just amazing, you know, and then you, like you said, you're reacting to a stimulus that someone's going to give, you know, and sometimes it does um so i just thought it was it was interesting if you got if you get a chance go look at that kyler murray film and, and there's some there's some videos out where you can see it and they, they zoom in on the knee and super slow motion you can literally see that tibia slide forward i mean it's it's pretty uh and the reason why that happens is that as he plants and cuts there's a strong contraction of the quadriceps and when that happens it pulls the tibia forward and that's what creates the it's that high velocity that causes the ACL to tear. Which makes sense because the quadriceps, and if you're a student in my kinesiology class, you know, we'll be talking about this, controls knee flexion. It's an eccentric contraction of the quadricep to control the amount of flexion that the knee is going into when you're, you know, say walking down steps or you're getting ready to make a cut because you're lowering your center of, center of gravity before you change direction. So, yeah, it's just really interesting, um, the mechanisms there. So let's move into the next question then. What are the signs and symptoms of an ACL injury. And you know, you were an athletic trainer, you've been on feet on the field, you go out there, the athletes down and you're asking them what, what happened? what do you feel? What, what do they tell you? 
usually the universal sign of a of an ACL injury is the athlete grabbing their knee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when they're on the ground, usually you see the wails of pain, of course, but um, right. typically they'll say that they felt something pop. And usually with that pop, they oftentimes will will collapse to the ground. So that's usually a pretty good indicator yep. <laughs> that that's possibly what, what, what has happened here. It doesn't mean other structures aren't injured, but rest assured that that's more than likely what happened. When you see the plant and cut, you see the knee collapse, they go to the ground, they grab their knee, it's a pretty decent sign. Um, when you're actually evaluating a knee, uh, there's a couple different orthopedic tests you can do. One is called, the most reliable one that's been used most often in literature called the Lachman test, mm -hmm. where essentially you, you stabilize the, the, the femur with one hand, you take the tibia with the other hand, and you pull forward. And typically, if the right. ACL is gone, there's not going to be that firm end point, almost like if you were to tighten up a shirt. Like, that's how that feels if a ligament's taut. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if uh, uh, there's another one called the anterior drawer, it's commonly used. You prefer the Lachman, uh, as I stated. But then, uh, then to diagnose it, really, you need an MRI to, to really d determine the extent right. of the injury. Yeah, and that was one of the other questions I know um, that I had was, was some of those tests and and personally i know there was a year where i was actually coaching at a, a small rural kansas high school as an assistant football coach and our quarterback went down and I remember the athletic trainer was out there checking the knee doing the anterior drawer test you know trying to translate slide that tibia forward and the lockman and she wanted me to check it and, and i did it and it was amazing because this is the first time i'd ever felt a knee that wasn't intact mm -hmm. and yeah there was no firm endpoint. i was like oh my gosh yeah that's that's um <laughs> I think he's yeah. torn his ACL. I mean, right. it was it was pretty obvious. And um, now I know, and this leads into the other point, because of that, you know, and you've got this sliding forward of the tibia on the femur, um, instability is obviously going to be another right. complaint that, right. that an athlete or, or somebody is going to have, right. um, especially probably more so as like the swelling wears off. So, you know, maybe that first week, um, because I've heard about this, they, they get some swelling in the knee and it starts to feel a little stable, but maybe after that week passes and they haven't yeah. done anything, it's like, then it starts feeling really, the knee right. joint starts and, and feeling really unstable. And that's the primary indication for surgery is the instability piece. Yeah. You know, it, it, usually when you get, when, when that initial inflammatory phase wears off, I mean, some folks have pain, some don't, but really the, if, if it's buckling and giving way all the time, that's one of your main reasons to consider surgery. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on here. So why are ACL tears, and I've seen different statistics on this. I'm sure you could provide a more accurate figure probably, but I've seen anywhere from three to six times more likely to occur in females, two to 10 times more likely to occur in females versus males competing in similar activities or the same sports. I mean, bottom line is they just, it's more prevalent in females. So can you give some reasons why that is? What what does the it's scientific a, yeah. literature say? Because there's a lot of speculation. Sure, there's a it's a complicated question. Um, I will say that we've evolved in our knowledge of this. We used to um, uh, suggest things like when they talk about the Q angle at the knee that women have uh, typically have a wider pelvis, which creates that kind of that valgus angulation at the knee, which can leave them predisposed. We know that's not really the case anymore. Uh, they've talked before as well about, it, does the menstrual cycle have an effect? In the 90s, there was a ton of literature dedicated to that, and that, does that have an effect? Um, not really the case. We can't really define that, and that's one of those ones, what are you really going to do with it anyway? Right. This is just part of their biology, right? right. So um, I, I think what's probably, uh, what I would point to is a couple of things. So one, in 1996, there was a study, it was a landmark study that came out in American Journal of Sports Medicine that looked at um, the difference between how uh, women and men land from jumps. And effectively what they found in this study is that when, uh, you know, the hamstrings are the best friend of the ACL. It's a, what they call an agonist to the ACL. Essentially, I tell patients that the, you know, the, the, hamstr the hamstrings attach in the back of the tibia and when they contract, it pulls back the tibia, almost like the reins on a horse. Well, when men typically land from a jump, they pre-activate the hamstrings prior to landing. And, um, and, and women, on the contrary, tend to pre-activate pre the quadriceps. So when they land, rather than have that protective effect of the hamstrings, you know, they're almost putting themselves at risk because of that. Um, but what we're learning more now, though, is that it's things like related to 
coaching. Like women often don't have the same access to coaching that men do. They often, um, there's still a bit of a stigma uh, with, it's better, it's much better than it right. was, but lifting weights, you know, sometimes there's a the stigma of lifting weights and making them bulky or, well, they look too masculine, you know, right. things like that. So it's sometimes changing perception, changing thoughts that it's good to get in and, 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 and lift weights and get stronger. Um, also, too, just in how, oftentimes how, how they execute cuts and changes of direction, there, you know, has been some... Uh, some literature to suggest that there's a bit of a difference between the sexes there. So, uh, and also too, just uh, how they go, like I said, how they execute these movements is, are things that we can certainly address in, in training and conditioning. So uh, it's, it's a very, like I said, a very complicated question. Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive at all in my response. Right. It's, it's loaded. It's a very, very loaded, loaded question. Um, what, I, what I try and say with a lot of this stuff um, is focus on the modifiable risk factors. The modifiable risk factors, we, there's been some correlation to weak hips and lack of control at the knee. So we can address hip strength. There's been, um, you know, with hamstring weakness and stuff, we can address quad and hamstring strength. We can work on change of direction. We can work on jump and landing technique. You know, not to... Yep. Not to land with a straight, stiff knee, but yep. to land, you know, soft with more knee flexion, hips behind you, things like that. That's stuff that we, as as fitness professionals, rehabilitation professionals, that that we can actually impart some change on. And that's what right. I'd like to focus on, I think, from, right. from my practice anyway. Like you said, focusing on those modifiable risk factors. I know we talk about it. Well, I just talked about it in a class. Uh, yesterday, it was, you know, we were talking about cardiovascular disease risk factors, and there's modifiable and non modifiable ones for those. It's like, well, you can't change your sex, but um, if you have a sedentary lifestyle or you're a cigarette smoker, yeah, you can quit right. smoking cigarettes and you can get more active. Well, and I think, it's, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the, the neuromuscular control, the differences in that. That's, that's really interesting between males and females, how, like you said, the males tend to preactivate the hamstring. That's going to help keep the tibia pulled back and in alignment with the femur, prevent that stress on the ACL. But females, again, just to drive this home, they, in, in the studies you've read, they tend to preactivate the quad in anticipation of landing. And obviously the quad then, you know, through the patellar tendon is going to tend to pull the, right. the shin bone forward. That's... It's really interesting. Right, and, and as we talked about with some of these non-modifiable things, and we could talk all day about the menstrual cycle, but really, what are you going to do with that? Right. You know, if, I mean, I, I, I've mentioned this before in many talks, and, and it's, it's not, to be, uh, to, not to be flippant or anything, but uh, again, as I said, what are you going to do with that? If, if we, let's just say we find that a certain phase of the menstrual cycle uh, is is when most ACL tears occur, and it's the final four, and it's the semifinals of the final four in, in women's basketball. Right? Are you going to tell the coach that? Well, we found that this particular phase of the menstrual cycle right. causes ACL tears, and seven of your players right. are in it right now. You should probably forfeit. Like, right. what do we do with this no. information? We yeah. can't do anything with it, right? Right. It's the same thing like they've showed before, like notch width, like where the ACL sits in the knee. It's it's called the intercondylar notch, and that it does a narrow notch lead to tears. We can't do anything about it. Yeah. What that. are you going to do? That, that's, right. that, that's how they're made. Right. right. Like, so we can't change any of that. That's why I said I think right. it's, it behooves us as professionals to focus on what we can change, uh, and and the things that we talked about are things that we can definitely change. Yeah. And I might just mention it. I know I have students that, that ask about that, the hormonal change in the, in the menstrual cycle, and there's not strong evidence. The, the evidence is kind of weak. Um, but I guess the thinking is, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's as a woman is heading into the ovulatory phase, so ovulating kind of mid-cycle around day 14, and you, you're seeing estrogen levels rise, that's what they've correlated the um, increased ACL laxity and the increased risk of well, ACL injury too. And I know now this is in vitro studies. So an in vitro is like a test tube study and you can't always extrapolate what happens in a test tube into an in, in vivo living human body. But I know there are some studies in vitro where they took the ACL out. You know, they basically put it in a, in a dish or a tube and they expose it to high levels of estrogen and they say, well, you know, this is altering collagen synthesis and there's not as much collagen here and now the, the ligament isn't going to be as, as stiff and it's inhibiting the fibroblast from producing collagen. But just because, and this is where, be careful when you're reading studies, if you're just in the general public or you're a student, because just because you find something in vitro, right, that estradiol 
the, the ACL being exposed to estradiol has this effect on collagen synthesis and laxity, it doesn't mean that's necessarily what's going to be happening in vivo in the human body. Right. right? And again, what are you going to do about it? Right. That's how they're made. Like right. They have found that there's this hormone called relaxin, that the ACL has these relaxin receptors uh, that f women have that men don't, and it's because it's a hormone that's uh, usually secreted during pregnancy to allow for you know, expansion of the pelvis so they can give birth, right? Well, what do we can do about that? That's their biology. Right. Right? So, yeah. uh, again, I, we can talk about these things. Uh, as you said, that we, the evidence is really weak. Uh, yeah. It's not great. So let's focus on what we can change. Right. Dr. Lorenz is practical, right? Focus on the things we can change. I like it. All right. So... Let's move on um, to, and we've kind of covered this already, how ACL injuries diagnosed. So you mentioned the Lachman test, the anterior jaw test. Obviously, MRI is going to be used to see that soft tissue inside the knee. Um, you know, anything else you want to add there? I mean, I think we pretty much pretty much covered no, how you ACL sure, is typically it'll diagnosed. Tell you if anything else happened too, like did you get an associated meniscus tear? It'll tell you the extent of maybe there's a cartilage injury. You know, sometimes right. if you really have a high speed, a high velocity contraction, you can, you know, fleck off a piece of cartilage off the end of the bone, almost like, you know, chipping an iceberg almost, you know, right. you could do that too. So that complicates things further. So it just makes sure that we know the extent of the soft tissue and uh, the soft tissue injury in the knee. Right. No uh, unhappy triad going on in there. So, right. you know. <laughs> well, yeah, right, right. And that is, you know, uh, the, I'm not sure if everybody knows what that is, but right. uh, it's an ACL tear, MCL tear, and a medial meniscus tear. Again, because of that combination of that, you know, the knee kind of buckling inward with the rotation, you can get all, all three of those things injured. Right. Right. And typically, if you have now, now kind of talking briefly about the meniscus, since we brought it up again, when I talked about knee joint anatomy on the tibial plateau, the top surface of the tibia, if you were looking down on it, you have these two C-shaped discs and those are the menisci. That's plural. You have your medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. Um, but if you have a little tear in the meniscus and typically that's going to happen like if there's, you know, like compression and rotation, Lo right? Loaded twisting. Right. right. Loaded Sorry, twisting tear. portion. Yeah, portion. Yeah. So if you have that torsion there, um, you might, may get a meniscus tear. And um, typically signs and symptoms of that, uh, what's it going to be more like um, pain with weight bearing, like a, feeling like the knee is going to lock if you're trying to flex or extend it, things yeah, like that? Uh, usually there's a lot of things. So joint line tenderness is one. Um, swelling, depending on where you tore it, might be delayed. Uh, the... Um, buckling or giving way again, the joint can lock on you. You know, yeah. like if there's actually a, a tear that goes up into the joint, you might not be able to bend your knee past a certain point or extend it past a certain point. It's kind of like a road bump. Right? I mean, a, it is. a, a it speed bump is. in the joint, that flap of cartilage like a sticking jam. up. It's like a yeah. door jam just yeah. in the way, right? So uh, those are the, probably the main ones. Typically, people with meniscus tears tend to have pain going upstairs because as they go upstairs, the knee extends. There's a twist at the end there, yeah. that, that what they call a screw hole mechanism, you know, that mm -hmm. where you kind of grind at it a little bit like a mortar and pestle. So that's th those are typically, you know, good signs. But again, the MRI is probably the better best way right. to diagnose that all righty uh well, let's move into acl injury classification so how are acl injuries classified like the grading um and then maybe talk about you know can a the acl heal on its own do you always need surgery maybe athletes versus non-athletes can somebody that's not an athlete get by with a torn acl so what are your what are your thoughts on all of that. Um, so as far as whether or not you need to fix it, a lot of that is a kind of an individual decision. If you have a very low level of activity, um, you don't have a high demand type lifestyle, you're not playing what they call level one sports. That's the cutting, jumping, twisting, pivoting sports. You know, if you're not doing that, um, you might be able to get away with it. You know, there's been a lot of literature overseas that, you know, again, mostly because a lot of them have a nationalized health system. You know, where surgery is delayed, it might be several months, maybe longer before you get surgery. So you don't have a yeah. choice. You have to rehab it. You know, yeah. you have to try some things to see. So um, does everybody need surgery? Not necessarily. You should go through a rehabilitation process to see if you're what they call a coper. There's what they call copers and non-copers. So copers are the people that are able to do this without surgery. They don't have the buckling or giving way incidences. They don't have the chronic instability. The non-copers are the ones that we tried to rehab, but I'm still having trouble, and it's still buckling and giving way. So those are the ones that, that probably should consider surgery. Um, are there sp specific things that, like, predict a, a coper versus a non-coper? I mean, is there... 
uh, uh, good question. I I don't believe there is a specific like demographic characteristic or uh, pred- predictive factors that why you would. I think a lot of it is just going through at least. We know that go through at a minimum of six weeks of focused rehabilitation on quad and hamstring strengthening, balance retraining, neuromuscular control training, so learning, landing from a jump, things like that, to see if they're able to do it. And then that's when those things start to tease themselves out if they're able to, to cope or, or, or if they're not a coper. Because it's interesting. It reminds me of the former Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver, Heinz Ward. If I remember this correctly, I think he was born without an ACL in one of his knees. So, again, this is just a congenital abnormality. Again, nothing he could... I know, Do, that, but, I know um, that John Elway played a lot of his career without an ACL. Um, I believe Steve Eiserman, who is a Hall of Famer NHL hockey player from the Detroit Red Wings, one of the best to play the game in his position, uh, I believe he was without an ACL. Uh, and now they, they were born without it? No, or they no, had... just played, they just played okay. through the they tear. Just played well, again, through they're it. freakish okay. athletes. Right. They can do things that right. the rest of us can't do, yeah. right? Uh, Thurman Thomas, legendary running back from Buffalo Bills in the 90s. I mean, yeah. he didn't have an ACL, and I think he may, he may have had an ACL tear in both knees, like, which is <laughs> yeah, remarkable as an NFL right. running back at the caliber that, that he was. And so, his style of running, right. it was a lot of cutting, a lot of changing yeah. direction. I mean, he wasn't a straight-ahead, you know, run-over-everybody running back. I yeah. mean, he was a lot of change direction. But again, having worked with a number of professional athletes in my career, they're just built differently, yeah. and they can do those things. And, I, and that's just scratching the surface of athletes that are, 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 that are able to play at a high level without an ACL. So it's not impossible. Right. It, it truly is not, but it, it does take some work. You know, but again, a lot of athletes are don't have the timetable to wait and see. Well, let's see if six weeks of rehab yep. works. Now, if it doesn't work, now you, you potentially wasted six weeks. You're still getting good training, so there's still some benefit to that. I don't want to say that there's not a benefit of doing six weeks of strengthening and balance work. But if you get to that six weeks, you're still having trouble. It's like, well, I could have had surgery, you know, five weeks ago, and I'm yeah. well on my way to recovery, right? So there, there's a lot that goes into that. Like, you know, what's your what's your prospects of playing after where you're at? You know, is this sophomore year, junior year, senior year? What happened, you know, again, all that, there's a lot of factors that go into deciding what you're going to do. Right, like anything, for sure. And then maybe going back to the to the grading of the ACL injuries, right, can you kind of define a, those those grades? Yeah, I mean, with an ACL, because it's such a high-velocity injury, I mean, sometimes you can hit get just right where it stretches a little bit, so you're a little loose but not torn. Um, you know, and, and you're really getting into the, like we're talking millimeters of difference here, and you, there's only there's one device, um, that's, it's called the, um, the KT-1000, it's a knee joint arthrometer, a lot of people don't have them, huh. where it kind of shows the millimeters of difference side to side. Uh, and that's really where the grade one, grade two, grade three comes in. Uh, do they heal? Like, okay, so if you stretch it a bit, it may, may tighten up a little bit over time as it heals. Uh, but you're still probably going to have a little bit of laxity there. Mm-hmm. Um, in regards to do you does it heal if it tears, there have been some recent papers um, in British Journal of Sports Medicine specifically recently that have shown that there's been spontaneous healing. Uh, we don't really know why, though, like who heals spontaneously or yeah. how or why. Uh, not something I would put a lot of, I wouldn't count on that a lot. Weight into. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Uh, well, because what I've always understood, it, it, you look – the ACL and PCL, you know, they're making this X, they're intra-articular ligaments. They're inside the knee. There's a lot of synovial fluid in there. I think generally the way I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong from what I've, everything I've read, is because they're intra-articular ligaments and there's poor blood supply, I mean, they tend to be they're poor at healing versus, say, you look at, like, the MCL that's outside the knee, um, it's it's totally different. I mean, it, it tends to heal better on its own, and um, you know, yeah, the, the better blood it's, supply. It's a capsular ligament, so it's a little different in structure. You know, the the MCL is more sheet like, whereas the ACL and PCL are more kind of rope like, I guess, right. for lack of a better term. Uh, they do actually have good the good blood supply. Do they? Uh, okay. Yeah, there's there's different different parts that have better blood supply than others, but it, it does, it, okay. they do a pretty good blood. The menisci, uh, on the contrary, right. don't have great blood supply. Because yeah. as you weight bear, you squeeze blood out, right? Yep. So only the outer third of the meniscus right. has uh, That red zone, supply. they call it the red right, zone. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and that's what a physician or a surgeon will decide when they're in there. Like if you tear in the avascular zone, it's not going to heal. Right. Like, so you probably have to cut it out, right? right? Whereas if, if even a little bit of the tear gets into the vascular zone, then there is prospects right. that, it, that it could heal. So yeah. if you do tear, you hope that it's in the vascular zone so they can fix it. Because you right. do want to save save as much of the meniscus as possible just for long-term health of the knee. I guess and when I talk about ligaments being, maybe I should have been more precise with my words, the, the ACL and PCL are... I guess less vascular than obviously say like muscle tissue, but oh, yeah. they're more, scale, they're yeah. more vascular yeah. 
than cartilage, especially oh, like. Oh, okay. If you say it like that, then yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Semantics here. How 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 I'm thinking of it in my mind versus how you're thinking yeah. of it. So yeah. All right. Um, uh, let's see. What else did I want to cover? Um, let's just move on to question number six here. So what are the um, non-surgical surgical treatment options for ACL injuries? Now, you know, I know you're not an orthopedic surgeon. I do know one at uh, Kansas University Medical Center, Dr. Vincent Key. When talking about what types, there's different graphs, and I'm sure you can talk about these different graphs that you can use to reconstruct, replace that completely torn ACL, you know, like a grade three injury. Um, he, he likes a patellar tendon graft. I mean, do you have any, uh, like, preference as far as grafts? Hamstring, patellar tendon, um, cadaver, I mean. I've never been one to, I think a, a 14-year-old high school female soccer player is a much different argument than a 330-pound uh, Division I offensive tackle. Right. <laughs> so I think it depends on who's in front of you. There's a lot of different graphs. None of them are perfect. They all have pros and cons, every one of them. Uh, I have a preferred graph choice just because we have the most. Can you maybe talk about those graphs a little yeah, bit? So, like so what I would the... say right now, currently, I would say m- most would say the gold standard, I think, still, is the bone, patellar tendon bone graph. So what they do, uh, the surgeon does, is they take the central third of the patellar tendon and they take a bone plug from the tibia and they take a bone plug from the bottom of the patella. So it's bone, tendon, bone. They drill a tunnel and they put the, the graft through the tunnel with the idea that bone will heal better to bone. Right. Okay, so that's the bone, patellar tendon, bone. Now they have soft tissue grafts that are um, basically there's soft tissue fixation. So there's not the bone, tendon, bone. It's more... Uh, so they can take hamstring tendon, okay? We see that a lot. That's a common graft. They do well, right? Um, quad tendon is another graft that you take. Instead of the patellar tendon, you take the distal quad tendon. Yeah. Same thing. It doesn't have bone patellar tendon. Or it's not two uh, bony uh, ends of it. It's just soft tissue that's secured in place with other devices that's beyond the scope of this discussion, right? right? So there's, there's different choices there, Um and then one of the, the one choice I would say that I prefer is not an option is what they call an allograft, which is a cadaver graft. Um, mm-hmm. We know from the literature, long-term studies, that they do stretch out over time. Okay. So, I mean, there are certain subsets of the population that allograft isn't a bad idea. You have a multi-ligament knee injury. It's probably going to be used. If maybe you're in your 50s or 60s, you tear your ACL, you're not super active, you're going to be on your feet faster with an allograft. That's, so that is the one benefit of an allograft. Um, but by and large, I would say most of the grafts we see are either quadriceps tendon, patellar tendon, or bone patellar tendon bone graft, or hamstring tendon graft. There is uh, some people that take the other patellar tendon, uh, and that's, I don't know many folks that do that. There's one surgeon in particular that does. Um, They're big believers in it, but I would say that's not a quote-unquote a mainstream graft choice. Uh, so that's an option. And even recently, I mean, we've tried the ACL repair, repair before, like trying to stitch the ends back together. They've tried you know, pig grafts, all this other stuff. Those things have not held up. There is some promise with a new, uh, a new uh, ACL repair technique called the BEAR, meaning the Bridge Enhanced ACL Reconstruction. Uh, essentially, what I tell people, think of a hollowed-out marshmallow, <laughs> and they put that between the two the two ends, they, they essentially it's sutured together. There's some biological healing factors in there. Um, it's very early. Uh, the failure rates are a little bit high right now on that. I think, again, my, my thought is similar to an eight allograft. People do too much too soon because they feel good because they didn't take their own right. tissue. So yeah. they feel like they can be, be world beaters. They're doing way too much too aggressive things too fast. Mm-hmm. And they end up failing, right? Yeah. So anyway, I hope that wasn't too long-winded to answer no. the question. But there, it really comes down to uh, surgeon preference, maybe some belief biases that you have from talking to other people that, oh, I had this graft and I really liked it, or you know, so and so got back a little faster with this one. Um, you know, it. I, I kind of like the non-modifiable risk factor stuff. Right. <laughs> to me, the graft is the wrong argument. I think far, far, far more important is the rehab, the return to play process, all that stuff. Well, but how could a certain graft impact rehab? Like, so let's say you do the hamstring, right? You do the hamstring graft, then what are the implications for rehab, you know, after surgery? Because that area, you got to allow time for that to heal. 
the graph site. I mean, so so what are the well, implications for, example, for so you like, there? You know, if you're, let's say you have two graphs. You have bone patellar tendon bone and you have a hamstring graph. Well, you take the bone, you take the patellar tendon, it's going to take a lot longer for the quads to recover. Right. The hamstrings are fine. Yep. Now, if you have a hamstring graph, flip it around. Right. You know, we've seen people that are, you know, 11, 12 months out of a hamstring graft that have 40, you know, 45, 50% hamstring strength, but their quads are fine. So it's like... But so, see, I guess that's where I'm going. If, yeah. if their hamstring strength is reduced, and we know the hamstring is important at keeping that tibia... Yeah. Uh, preventing it from translating forward and placing right. stress on the ACL, th- then that hamstring strength is important. I guess that's kind of wh- where my line of thought was. Is it's you're, not, like, you're not incorrect. I mean, uh, it, the hamstrings are the best friend of the ACL, and that's the argument about do you do a hamstring graft on a female, a young female who already has uh, more than likely, relatively speaking, okay, speaking broadly here, right. <laughs> they're, they're probably a little weaker in the hamstrings anyway, probably from lack of training, et cetera. Are you going to make them weaker by taking their hamstrings? Right. Okay. So that that's an argument that a lot of physicians make about not using the hamstring graft. The pro hamstring graft people say, well, but I don't want the anterior knee pain that people end up having with the bone toe tendon bone, which is a thing. Right. Right. So ugh, there's a lot that goes into yeah, this. It's, you know? Yeah. There's a lot that goes into this. So then that person with the patellar guy, they're com- going to be com- complaining about, you know, squatting down, like you said, bending at the knee. So it's, it's, I guess pick your poison in a way, it's, it's, right? You I took mean, words right out of my mouth. Yeah, we were right here on that because I was just going to say you're, you're picking your poison. Do you want hamstring weakness, you know, uh, as a problem that you have to address, or do you want the quad weakness as a problem to have to address? So, um, and, but you got to train both in rehab anyway, and they both need to be to a certain level, regardless. Yeah. And it may take the you may it's going to take you probably the same amount of time, all things being equal, whether or not you do one graft or the other. It's just which is the one that's got more of a deficit. Right. Okay. All right. So let, let's move on to uh, discussing rehabilitation after ACL reconstruction surgery. So can you explain the different rehabilitation phases? Maybe how long each phase lasts typically and then what the goals are for the patient in each phase of rehab, kind of hitting milestones, you know, sure. throughout that rehab process. Yeah, so the origin, like right out of surgery, uh, you know, we want to control your pain. You know, uh, we want to get that swelling out of the knee. We want to get you functional again. So if if you're allowed to weight bear, let's get you walking again. Let's get your, your quad muscle firing because that's what you're going to need to walk, you know, without a brace anyway. Um, let's get your, you know, we really got to get your knee as straight as possible as soon as possible, assuming it's indicated. Sometimes if you have other, if you did a PCL or other Mm-hmm. multi-ligament procedures, there might be some limitations there, but you want to get that knee as, as straight as possible, as soon as possible. Um, you want to get that knee moving and bending soon. It, motion is, motion's lotion, as they say. <laughs> motion's good for the joint, for healing, for the graft, and things like that. You don't want to immobilize these things. You want to get them going. So really, those are the main things early on. Get the pain under control, get swelling out, uh, get, get, get some basic functional level things going, get gait normal when it's appropriate. And then really after that, it's a long process of getting the knee stronger again. So it's, frankly, in a lot of respects, it's a lot of uh, leg presses and squats and trap bar deadlifts and step ups and step downs and often in multiple directions. You're going to limit the depth in the early phases. Usually the ACL graft is at its weakest anywhere from six to eight weeks. So we're careful about how deep we go, how aggressive we are, those kind of things. But again, it's when we talk about phases, I mean, there's certainly some goals you'd like to achieve ideally by certain dates, but really it comes down to criteria. It's not a time-based right. injury. It shouldn't be a time-based injury. People latch onto time, but yeah. everybody recovers at a different rate. And, and there's different reasons why. Access yeah. to equipment insurance unfortunately like all there's so many factors that go into that and i like how it's changed to that being more criteria based or outcome based yes. like you meet this um this if goal this or this outcome is, yeah. then we go to the next for sure and then you meet yeah. that we go to the next um and it's kind of like it make it make, reminds me of like the nfl's you know concussion protocol it's like okay it's, it's not so much is the athlete going to be out you know two weeks or three weeks or a week it's like no you go through the phases of the protocol and once you meet this outcome, then you move to the next outcome, right? And then eventually you, you return to play. So yeah, I think the outcome based is, because so many people just, they do, they get hung up on time. Well, when am I going to be back? You know, is it nine months? Is it 12 months? And now that I mentioned time, I mean, on, in general, generally speaking on average, because, you know, people, especially athletes want to know that. Well, when can I play again, you know? Well, Dr. Lorenz, like, you know, how long is it going to be? And you obviously don't know 
you know, you don't know how hard that athlete's going to work in rehab or how the, all these other factors that go into when they can return to play. But on average, typically, when can, from the date they have the injury and they go through rehab um, and assuming they rehab, you know, hard and they, they really take it serious, when can they get back on the field safely, <laughs> generally? Well, let's start with what it's not, more than likely. For a long time, it was six months. Everybody was told six months, six months, and we've just latched onto that and perseverated over it, okay? That uh, at six months, I'm ready to go. The, there is an extraordinarily small subset of the population that is ready at six months. And to be, to be honest, there's been three papers that I'm aware of <laughs> in the last six months that have shown that people that recover faster are at a greater risk of ACE, like re-tearing because they amp up their activities so fast, they increase their athletic exposure. So they're doing more too, too soon and their body hasn't acclimated to those repeated stresses. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're doing too much too soon, so they re-tear, rather than somebody that waits a little longer. So you, you could be both ends of the spectrum. You go back and you weren't you know, ready from a muscular standpoint, you re-tear. Or you were ready, but you did too much too soon, you re-tore, right? So there, it's kind of in the middle. So six months, it's more than likely not. We now know that if we, if we can just stretch things out to at least nine months, Typically, uh, there's some been literature to, to suggest that with every, broadly speaking, again, for every month that you can pass beyond six months, your risk goes down about another 25%. So if I could just get you to nine or 10 months post-op, if you want to go back to a level one sport, again, cutting, pivoting, change of direction, mm -hmm. jumping type sports, um, your risk goes down almost 100%. So I would say right now when we counsel our patients that, you know, uh, it's, it's nine to 12 months-ish before you're fully back, no restrictions, those kind of things. But uh, again, that definitely varies between, um, between the athlete, what level they're going back to, future plans, right. is there pressure from coaches, from mom, yeah. that, that matters too, yeah. you know. Uh, so a lot, uh, other friends, I mean, I, one of the conversations I have on the first post-operative day with my athletes is I want you to minimize the noise from other people. Well, I was back doing this at four months or five months and all these other things. I mean, there's so many factors that go right. into that. That like, person's not you. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. It's a different sport. They were right. older at the time. Well, but there's so much that right. goes into it. You know, for example, if you tear a meniscus and they repair it, you're typically not fully weight-bearing and able to even squat at all for six weeks. Well, I tell people that if you have a meniscus tear and they repair it and you have an ACL reconstruction with it, your clock really doesn't start ticking till about the six-week point. So even if you're six months, technically, you're really only four and a half because we couldn't do a lot. We could do some stuff, yeah. but we really couldn't get after it, so right. to speak, until six weeks, right? So this is why I said you have to be very careful about comparing yourself to others, latching on to a certain time. You're ready when you're ready. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. And are people, have I cut people loose at six months? Yes, I have, but I've also made the caveat, just so you know. There is some literature suggesting that you do this too soon, you have a, a risk of re-tearing. Right? Yeah. So we have those discussions, and people are going to, you inform them the best you can. You give them, here's the latest information that we know. You decide. And that's what I like. Dr. Lorenz is evidence-based, and he tries his best to be. Like you heard him say it. He provides literature. He's, he's going to base, you know, you base your treatment approaches off what the scientific evidence says, and, of course, your years of experience. I mean, there's... Right. Experience is a factor here too. All the years that you've accumulated dealing right. um, with, with athletes and these injuries. So for sure. Um, all righty. So moving on to, um, well, I'll go back to this. I think about you mentioned some of the exercises in rehab. You know, the leg presses, the you know squatting movements. Most of them, if I remember correctly, they were all like closed chain movements. Mm -hmm. This wasn't even on my question list. It was just something yeah, yeah. I thought of. I know so, you're going with this, and I love it. Good. What, what are your <laughs> thoughts on closed chain versus open chain exercise? Now, just so you, everyone understands, a closed chain exercise, if we're talking lower extremity, is when the feet are in contact, you know, for instance, with the ground. Like a deadlift is a closed chain exercise. The distal part of the distal extremity is not moving. So feet are in contact with the ground. You're doing a deadlift. You're doing a squat. You're stepping up onto a, you know, a step. Open chain would be something like, a leg extension, a hamstring curl, where the, the distal extremity is moving through space, okay? So just to define closed chain and open chain. So what are your thoughts on that? Doing closed chain exercises in rehab versus open chain, like leg extensions and yes. hamstring curls and all that? So uh, great question. Um, this has definitely gone through an evolution. When I came up in the 90s, 
you know, if you did open chain, like seated knee extensions at the gym, like terrible, you're a worst, worst clinician ever. You're going to stretch the graft, all these things, you know, it was just, they put this, this you know, fear mongering yeah. basically that, right. you know, that you're you're, get out yeah. of here. <laughs> so it's, it's only squatting, right? Well, right. fortunately, uh, over time, the literature has shaken out that it's not the big bad wolf we used to think it is. Um, we, I advocate for open chain knee extensions. Again, open chain knee extensions with body weight. You don't have to, you don't have to put a heavy weight in them two days post-op, like everything, of course, within reason, you got to think, you got to use your head clinically, <laughs> right? Like there's, right. there's definitely, uh, there's a time and a place for all of it. Right. But it is definitely the literature suggests you should do a combination of both. Right. It's both, it's, it's a both and not either or. Yeah. Cause for some reason there's this notion that, Closed chain exercises are functional and open chain are not. But my argument, correct me if I'm wrong, what your thoughts on this are is like both open and closed chain are functional and can be because what does the knee do? The knee is a hinge joint. It flexes, it extends. It has some slight rotation like if it's, if it's flexed. And what is leg extension training? Well, you're loading the leg, the knee, um, as you move into extension, right? So... I mean, you're training the quadricep to do its function, which is extend the knee and get stronger. If you're doing an open chain, you know, that's a seated hamstring curl, a prone hamstring curl, yeah, it's an open chain exercise. But again, you're loading that hamstring and uh, you're strengthening its function, which is to flex the knee. So it's like, I, I don't know where this notion came from that it's like people view those open chain single joint exercises as non-functional. When I look at it like, no, it is. It's training the function of that muscle. It's a weak link in the chain. Right, and only, and only closed chain are functional. You function's know, it's one like, of those terms that gets thrown around right. recklessly and irresponsibly, I think, in our field. I, yes. And I, honestly, you know what I yes. go with? Mel Siff, he had a strength conditioning journal article in 2002. I know this quote for the most part because I use it so much, usually in the introductory slides when I speak. Uh, because I'm trying to get people off this idea that an exercise isn't functional. Right. We should, oh, we should, yes. ba we should base yes. the definition of function on the outcome we seek rather than the often contentious debate about if right. exercise is functional. So yes. if I am trying to get the quad stronger through open chain knee extension, it is functional because right. it is working on getting my quad stronger to execute function down the road. You said it better people than I did. People have said it. Well, <laughs> Mel Siff said it. Yeah. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I didn't do a great job on the quote, but fantastic article uh, about functional training. It's called Functional Training Revisited, 2002, Strength Conditioning Journal. Mel Siff actually, for, you know, I know this is an undergraduate uh, uh, undergraduate uh, uh, podcast, but uh, his book, Super Training, it, it should be on everybody's bookshelf. Yeah, it's it's dense. Don't read it when you're tired on a Friday night. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it's a it's an iconic text that we should all have. So yeah, and I totally agree. I hate that that word functional. I don't know if it's a trigger word for me or what, but it's like. I just want to ask the person, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's true. That's Define true. what you mean Because people that. say the same thing about, you know, you may hear about the Nordic hamstring exercise, you know, where the one where, you know, people kneel and they kind of fall right. forward onto the ground. Well, that's not functional. Like, when do you do that? Yeah, but it, there's been literature that shows... Which that I love, it, by the way. It increases, <laughs> increases hamstring length. It increases yep. hamstring strength. Therefore, it's functional, right? Right. So, uh, now, we can argue all day about, you know, if you do uh, uh, wall squats with a ball on a wobble board while you do dumbbell shoulder press... <laughs> Is that functional? I would say, well, what are you really doing? Like, tell me what your goal is here. Then we can argue about it being functional. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, your that's, goal that's, is to hurt yourself again, eventually. The, right, well, it's, the wrong, it's just the wrong <laughs> argument in my yeah, view, I guess. Right, it's, we're, right. we're arguing about the wrong things. Right. Yeah. I agree. The Nordics, yeah, I, that's a great exercise. It is. Way, we could hold, do a whole tangent on that. But yeah. we'll move on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We will stick to uh, the topic at hand today. So, um, Let's talk about, you know, you mentioned kind of going through these different phases or meeting different outcomes and, and, you know, improving range of motion and strength and all that as you move through. Let's talk about the terminal phase of rehab, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're approaching, you know, maybe roughly that nine-ish, ten-ish month mark in rehab. You're, you're getting ready to, to, to leave. In that terminal phase, what are you really focusing on to enhance knee function and just overall physical performance? There's typically a progression of activities that we go through, and it's all based on kind of where your your strength values and your other numbers match up. Um, but you know, usually we start with just straight ahead movements first, so jogging, and then we gradually pick up speed. Then we'll start, you know, with then we'll move to change of direction type of things. We always move from you know uh, jumps in place first, execute those on two feet, and then we move to jumps on two legs, right, moving in the in moving uh, like broad jumps, things like that. 
where we then move to a bounding type movements where you switch from one leg to the other. I mean, running is a bound, right? Right. Um, and then we would do like single, like hopping, like which is same leg to same leg. That's more terminal phase after you've achieved some 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 strength um, uh, benchmarks along the way. So that's to, and then we start adding multi direction to it, and then you start adding stimulus into the system. There's a there's a paper that was written not too long ago called you know the control chaos continuum. And when you're when you're jumping in the clinic with jump forward five times, there's no there's no reaction to a stimulus, there's no ball, there's no mm-hmm. opponent to evade, right? That's very much control. And then as they move along, we start to remove constraints, right? So now we may have them. Uh, react to a stimulus, maybe. We may right. have them... Because now that's getting more sport-specific. Right, which is, right. Yeah, right. And, and, right. Well, or getting more... Um, w- w- again, we're making them react to things rather than having pre-planned, mm. controlled environment. You know, yeah. just as we send them back to practice, right. they might go back and do individual drills with their coach or, you know, pra- like, uh, you know, pre-practice type things, but they might not scrimmage yet. Right. But then we move them into, like, let's say it's a soccer player. We might move them into small-sided games where it's 3v3 in a very small area, right? That might be the next step. Then we start to gradually transition them into team-based right. activities. Again, some of that's to get their fitness back up. Right. People forget that. Like, it's not yeah. just my, oh, I met the quad and hamstring goals. You yeah. haven't done anything, like, of any stress yeah. over several days for several months. You're out of shape. Right, the anaerobic capacity, right. the aerobic capacity, right. all the, all that is, yeah. I mean, the first time somebody clear. jogs in the clinic, like, yes. that first day, they're so excited, they're ready to go, they get to jog, they run 30 yards, they get to the other end, and they're like, <sighs> Yeah, you know what I mean. Like they, I mean, there's a fitness component that takes several months to get back in game shape again. Yeah. So I mean, again, very broad, you know, very ten thousand foot view of how we go about things. But there is a, definitely a, a progression, you know. In yeah. How we how we uh, increase activity level. I think that was a great point mentioning how you know you hop five times. You're told to hop five times forward. You know, it's so controlled, but you know, nothing on the field or the court. It's it's it can get very chaotic. I mean, it's not a controlled environment. So having that reactionary stimulus, I think that's um, it. Just it just makes sense. I mean, right. it's, you got to have that incorporated into that. So I, like for example, phase. I have, maybe give you a better example. So I have a high school quarterback right now. He's far away from doing these things yet. You know, but we'll eventually, you know, run without a ball in multiple directions at lower intensities, and we'll pick up intensity, and then I'll put a ball in his hand at lower intensity where he'll go into his his drops. You know, maybe we'll, you know, like typically like moving in a pocket. We'll do right. that maybe with, with a ball in his hand, not throwing to anybody, not reacting to anybody, pre-planned movements, right? Right. And then he'll probably start executing some throws, not to anybody specifically, we'll probably throw into a net just to get him to plant on that leg, right. to transfer weight to that leg, because that's another step. Mm-hmm. Right, and then we'll start to move to where you're actually throwing to a receiver, but not evading a defender. Right, mm-hmm. and then uh, eventually where you'd, you're back at practice, now you're throwing routes and maybe having to react to a, a defensive player. Right, right, but no, but non-contact. Yeah. So we right. do that to get their confidence up. Yep. Right, and then eventually it would be back to contact because I'm not. You can't reproduce tackling in the clinic, right? You're not going to be tackling your patients. Good luck with that, right? So that's what I'm saying. Oh, right? Dr. Lorenz, so, come on. Yeah, you I can tackle your patients. Wouldn't it be fun if we could? Just have them, you know, assumption of risk, yeah. waiver, you know, all the... Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like Informed consent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but that's typically, again, v- broadly speaking, kind of how that progression would go. Right. And you're gradually introducing more uh, chaos into the system, but they've developed the confidence uh, doing uh, easier, more controlled right. things earlier yeah. in the process. Right. It makes sense. You know, obviously they've got to have that range of motion back, the proprioception, the muscular strength. You know, you're building up the anaerobic, aerobic capacity, all these things. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. It's just baby steps. It I mean, is, it is. It's definitely you know? that. It's it's stay in the course, believing in the process, trusting. You know, hopefully you have a good provider that you trust. Um, you know, one of the I always trust the process, right? Yeah. Because like, it is a process. <laughs> it, it takes time. You will get there. You just got to put the work in. That's right. why I said sometimes. You know, I've had a lot of. I mean, I've been doing this 25 years. I've had a lot of patients tell me that you know this was a blessing in disguise. I never would have worked this hard you know, in the gym on my own right. and done the balance work and done the hip work and all the other stuff that we did here had this not happened, so, you know, so. And I'm glad you brought up the hard work because this is, I think this is overlooked, but it's important. I mean, it's just kind of brushed aside. Like a lot of people will think, oh, you know, you just have the surgery and you're done, you're good to go. No, 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 no. Like the rehab, I'm sure you can comment on this. Oh, yeah. How hard you work in rehab, it's so important. You have to grind and bust your butt in rehab. Mm-hmm. You, you, you have to, if you want to, get back to achieving anywhere near the same level of performance that you were at prior to the injury. I mean, it's just, I don't know, maybe you can, you already mentioned it, but it's just like that hard work and what you do in rehab is, 
it, it should not be overlooked. It's a grind. It takes months yeah. to get back. You know, you will test and oh, you improved another fifteen percent. Well, back to the leg press. You know, you're not where your other. You know, you're not where you need to be yet, right? So it just takes. Um, it, it does. It's just it, it. Stay the course. Be persistent. It, it takes time, and you got to put the work in. So this isn't a. You know, I know we're in a world now where you got 180 characters on on one media, and you got you know Snapchats and Instagram. Everything's here and gone, and you got it. And I can go order food. I can get something off another website, and I can get everything I need delivered to my door and within 24 hours. Well, it's not like that with AC, yeah. with ACL rehab. It's it's a process. Yeah, you got to work. Yeah, the ACL is not it's not DoorDash. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Yeah. All right, so. How can physical therapists and strength and conditioning coaches work together more effectively to bridge the gap, so to speak, between regaining knee function during rehabilitation and then achieving optimal levels of physical function for return to sports? That's a great question. So, um, so first off, uh, I think everybody has to know what the role is, you know, um, so, I mean, sometimes PTs want to be strength coaches and strength coaches want to be PTs. I think we all need to bring what we bring best to the table. It doesn't mean you can't do both well, but uh, I think having an understanding of, and speaking the language of each other's environment helps a little bit. You know, it's like, for example, sometimes, you know, PT colleagues of mine that may not have a great understanding of the weight room kind of have a, it's an all or nothing, no squats. We'll, we'll wait. Can we maybe squat to a box? You know, can we do trap bar? Uh, can we do cleans from boxes maybe, like our above knee cleans? Like you don't have to go to the floor, you know, right. like those kind of things. So I think to be able to speak the language a bit, I think giving them a, here's what you can do, here's what I'd like to hold off on for a few weeks. So to give, allow strength coaches to kind of spread their wings and do what they do because they're good at what they do, um, allow them to do that. But with also just in mind, here's some of the restrictions we still got to be mindful of. Right. There's a huge benefit getting the athlete back with their team, back training in the sport, out of the rehab setting, like there's mentally, that's good to have them back with their team. Cause that's where their identity is a lot of times. You know, you, you say that, oh, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm a college athlete or I'm a soccer player or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's first. It's not, I'm a, a son, a brother, a sister, a, you know, all that. It, it's, I'm a soccer player, right? So mm -hmm. getting their identity back is important. So that's one thing. I think, um, you know, I, interesting, I was talking to an NFL colleague of mine recently. He said, what he, some of the one things he battles sometimes is that you know, these, these uh, athletes have come from small colleges where the strength coach, because they don't have a lot of, they don't have a very deep athletic training staff, and mm -hmm. a lot of times they end up doing the rehab, so they think they're PTs, and, you know, I've had, I've had strength coaches just say things to me before that it's just been, holy cow, like, that is a completely ignorant comment, that like, you don't know the injury you're talking about, like, there, there's an element of ask the question, but don't make the assumption that you know what, you know, that you know what it is. Right. On the flip side, PTs, though, need to understand that these are athletes, it's okay to push, it's not the end of the world if they have a little bit of pain after a, a, an intense session, you're building capacity, right? So I think it's just, like I said, humility, knock down the silos, talk to each other, have an open line of communication, respect each other's spaces and what they're good at, you know, uh, if, if we do those things, uh, you're going to have a great relationship right. and, and can do good work for the athlete. Yeah, I think that's important. You know, everyone know your scope of practice and, and kind of what your lane is, but know that your lane's important. Your scope of practice is important. And like you said, the, it needs to be interdisciplinary. Yeah. I mean, that, that line, of, the line of communication, I mean, that just sounds so cliche, like we got to communicate, we got to talk, but it is. It is important for obviously the right hand, the left hand. Yeah, you know, again, it's not about you, it's doing. about the yeah. athlete. And, right. and you want to, you should, you have to have, ideally, the athletic trainer, the strength coach, and any rehab people are all talking every day about where people are at, kind of what, what, what the return to play process is, all those kind of things. Like there, there cannot be, you know, walls between the offices, so to speak. Yeah. Like you've got to get together. And I know when I worked oh, back in the early and mid 2000s as a a strength and conditioning coach at a, at a private facility in Wichita, Kansas. And we had, you know, several strength coaches in there. Uh, we had a uh, physical therapist, even had a nutritionist. It was kind of holistic one-stop shop. And, and we would have meetings and then talk and meet with the physical yeah. therapist so that we knew, Hey, you know, this pitcher that had, you know, Tommy John surgery or this rotator cuff issue or this player that, yeah, is coming off the ACL and they're, they're coming into that, the end of rehab, like we knew what was going on because we would talk directly to the PTs and the PTs would talk about what we were doing. And so, yeah, I just think it's, it's obviously um, critical. So, um, and it's funny you mentioned, I was thinking back, I, I remembered earlier when we were talking about going through the grind of rehab and just that mental grind, um, it's almost like you need a sports psychologist for a lot of these, hey, a that, lot of that, these that, uh, athletes oh. because like you said, getting that identity back, um, trusting 
the process, like you said, and trusting that they have the proprioception, they have the range of motion, they have the strength back to be able to use that knee again. Because sometimes I'm sure you may see this where <coughs> Excuse me. you know that it's ready to go, but maybe they don't in their right. mind trust. And this is why I encourage a lot of my students, um, if they're wanting to go to physical therapy school, I'm like, you know, you might get a minor in psychology <laughs> um, <coughs> just to, you know, be able to be empathetic, sympathetic with that athlete and, you know, it, there can be a mental block there, right? Getting there back is, on the and field. there's actually a thing called kinesiophobia, and we can actually test for that now. There, there's a, there's a, it's it's been validated in a number of studies. It's been shown to correlate to confidence in the knee going back to sport. But it, there's a, a scale that an athlete can fill called the ACL return to sport after injury scale, and there's a there's kind of a basement level score that you, that you know this is the lowest it should be, but you should see it increase over time. And we've we've learned that the higher that score is, often their knee confidence is better. So mental piece is huge. Like, it's a big deal. They, they have to, It's not just the physical, what your quad and hamstring strength is, but mentally, how do you feel about your knee? Are you ready to cut on that knee? If you're running back, are you ready to make that cut and get drilled from a linebacker coming the other way? That matters. Right. It absolutely matters. So, And it's hard to measure those things other than... Again, you can kind of do some stuff on paper, but it's an entirely different thing doing it on the field. Yeah, and I, you know, I think once they they move into working with the strength and conditioning coach or specialist. It's like, you know, a good strength coach is going to be able to assess and, and they should be assessing and evaluating the athletes they're working with and just looking at very simple things, you know, how they land, are they landing with, are the knees collapsing in when they jump? Uh, you know, obviously we could get into strength uh, imbalances between the hamstring and the quadriceps, um, you know, there's a lot of things. I know when I worked with young athletes, um, you know, eighth graders, freshmen, and, and especially girls, I would always, you know, before we even did any plyometrics, I generally wanted them to, before we did moderate or heavy, like high intensity plyometrics, and the NSCA states this, typically you should be able to squat one and a half times your body weight um, so that you have adequate strength to be able to handle that um, you know, the landing and, and that plyometric activity, whatever you're going to do. But I know a lot of times before we even got into plyometrics, I'm just looking at, you know, let me see you jump forward and just land. And let's look at how your right. joints are aligned. And let's right. just see if you can land. Very simple, right? But just simple assessments like that. I think it's very important for strength coaches to, um, to look at these things, right? And maybe you could talk about some barriers that are exist between, you know, PTs, and strength coaches, what, what are some some barriers, red flags, thing, things that you see that impair progress in, in an athlete in, re, in returning to sport? I think probably the first one to go through is just ego. You yeah. Know, sometimes there can be a lot of egos involved, and that can really get in the way. Um, sometimes, too, just philosophy. You know, if you have, let's say you have a, a strength coach that's um, heavily Olympic lifts, they're really into mm -hmm. that approach. And maybe the PT either isn't a fan or doesn't know a lot about it, or maybe the head team physician does not like Olympic lifts. Well, now we got to have a discussion. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Because there's de definitely a difference. And then it's like back to what's the evidence yeah. show, right? right. <laughs> well, yeah, that and some of that's just belief bias, too, right. unfortunately. So mm -hmm. I think there's there's some of that, of course. But I'd say those are probably the two biggest ones, I think, or what the barriers are. Um, and the field's very dogmatic. I mean, anything yeah. in rehab, fitness, I I've talked about this with others. It's like people are so set in their ways, right. which that is a huge barrier. It is, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, if it, again, similar to the whole idea of getting on the same page, but you know, sometimes people are really, really latch onto things that are either very anecdotal, um, not a lot of evidence to support it. I mean, I, I've been to a number of, uh, you know, continuing education courses before where somebody will say, well, I've just seen it work. There's value in that. But is there any, uh, is there any evidence to support the underlying theory to your approach? Right? right. So that's important too. That's why I said you've got to have a good handle on Here's what the evidence says. I've seen this work. I'm not going to ignore that, right? But we have to, where's that healthy balance? And I think a, a successful groups tend to find both right there. Yeah, and I've mentioned this, I know, to my students in classes before. Like, you know, have a hunger for learning. Don't ever think you know everything. I mean, I don't know everything. Yeah, I may have a doctor in front of my name, but I'm always learning. Going to conferences, yeah. learning from others. Gosh, I remember you gave a great talk at the state of Kansas and SCA conference several years ago about ACL injuries down in Emporia. And it's like, 
add tools to your toolbox and those tools being knowledge, right? And I think it's very unwise and, and it always rubs me the wrong way. And again, this is going back to the barriers. When I speak with a strength coach, a PT, I don't know, a chiropractor, it doesn't matter. Anybody in the health, wellness, rehab, fitness setting, and they just have this arrogance and they come across as knowing it all. It's just unwise because you don't. You're, you should always be staying abreast of current you know, studies, information in the field, I mean, modalities. Um, I didn't even know about this kinesiophobia. I mean, I, that term, you know, right there, just learning from that. You should always be learning and, and growing as a professional, no matter what your scope of practice is. If you're a PT, strength coach, it doesn't matter. Jordan, and, I'm leaving this interview and joining my staff for our monthly journal club where we reviewed two articles that are recent in the literature about our practice. So it's uh, you have to continually evolve. You have to continually grow. you got to challenge your biases. I know we're in a world now where we only huddle ourselves around people that we agree with. And no, you have to you have to expand your horizons. You've got to read things mm-hmm. that maybe maybe ruffle your feathers a bit. Yeah. You know, that's a good thing to ruffle your feathers. Yeah. <laughs> Facts, not feelings, right? right. Facts, yeah. not feelings. Right. Right. <laughs> All right. Because again, it goes back to not what you feel is right. It's what's best for the athlete or the individual that has suffered the injury, right? right? Put them first, Mm -hmm. step outside yourself, and it's all about getting them back to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's discuss ACL injury, should I say risk management, (laughs) injury prevention. Uh, Let's just say ACL risk management. Okay, what recommendations can you provide for designing an effective ACL, you know, injury prevention or risk management program? Well, first off, let's say the data has shown that doing, committing to, and complying with injury reduction programs do, in fact, reduce ACL risk. We have a lot of data supporting that. There's a lot of different programs out there that do it, okay? That's one. Secondly, your timing on this question is very good, as well as this interview, because uh, the Journal of Orthopedic and Sport Physical Therapy recently, like within the last few weeks, released their updated guidelines on evidence-based um, uh, interventions to prevent uh, ACL injury. Uh, and, and the best minds in ACL research uh, you know, got together and put this, put this document together. And really what it comes down to is that if, if we do things, uh, strength training, uh, core strengthening, uh, jump, jump and land retraining, like teaching people how to land, right. how to cut, how to jump, like that's a really good start. Some some programs have had balance training, not necessarily a requirement. Some do flexibility, never a bad idea, but not necessarily a requirement. The key is stick to it. Um, we need it. When you do it, you probably want to do it for at least 20 minutes. For a total, if you can get at least 30 minutes a week in, that's good. Normally what I try and tell athletes and coaches, if they're willing to listen, incorporate this stuff into your warm-up. You're going to warm up anyway. Right. right, like there's so many good programs out there that are, you know, there's the the FIFA 11 plus. You can you can Google that. There's Sports Metrics out of Cincinnati Sports Medicine. There's the PEP program, P P uh, per, um, Prevent Injury Enhanced Performance, which is out of Santa Monica, California. There's one called Harmony. It's it's uh, Harmo and K N E E. So it sounds like Harmony, but it's spelled that way. So there's a number of programs out there that you could do, but. A lot of them are, they really do a lot of the same stuff. Hip and general lower extremity strengthening, core strengthening, jump and land retraining, and sticking to it is key. So that's a that's a pretty good start. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any specific, I mean, you kind of got into it there. I mean, any specific, like, types of exercise that you really like that maybe strength and conditioning coaches, athletes, especially, you know, females, young athletes, should focus on to reduce the likelihood of an ACL injury? Mm-hmm. Uh Usually I say something's better than nothing. What are your resources too? That matters, right? You might be in a small rural community and don't have a lot, right? So I always tell with young athletes especially, gravity is resistance. Mm-hmm. If they do a, a single leg squat and their knee buckles in, their trunk's all over the place, mm-hmm. they're not reacting to gravity well. Right. So their body weight is plenty of resistance at this time, yes. right? Yes. So teaching them how to lunge, teaching them how to hinge, how to do a proper squat. Because you don't teach them how to squat right. Somebody, when they get to high school, is going to throw a bar on their back and never assess if they can do a squat right. Right, and then you're loading dysfunction, right? Right, You, exactly. you, never, exactly. you never load so, a dysfunctional movement pattern, right? Please yeah, do not planks, load dysfunction. Planks, <laughs> side planks, bridges, uh, uh, side-lying leg raises. Yeah, they're not exciting, but they provide a foundation, right? Right. So you start with the basics, you know, I, what I always tell the Foundational parents. Foundational strength. What I always tell athletes. patients and parents or whenever I speak, 
You don't start school in fifth grade. You start school in first grade, you get the foundations, and, by the, and then you progressively get to fifth grade stuff. But if you start with, uh, you know, uh, fifth grade stuff in first grade, you wouldn't be ready. And that's why it's so imperative that we, we do some uh, basic foundational strengthening before we throw a bar on a kid's back or put a bar on a kid's chest, right? You know, so starting with, again, f- fundamental things, uh, again, make it part of a pre-practice warm-up, even 15 minutes doing this stuff is, is, is really great because when we go practice, we work on the skill. We're not building athleticism. You know, we build athleticism through getting people stronger, Right? It's not just about working with the shooting coach or the swing coach or all these other coaches. Are you doing anything to build your capacity, to build your tolerance? Because you see people right. like me when you do too darn much <laughs> and you have tendon injuries or torn this or torn that because you haven't built capacity. Right. So by giving them a foundational level of strength is, is, is a great start and a great supplement to their skill training. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I brought you in and I was like, you know, Dr. Lorenz is going to be excellent to talk about this, and especially this, this bridging the gap between the rehab and the sports performance world working with strength and conditioning coaches is that, you know, you're an athletic trainer, so you, you've dealt with acute injuries right there on the field. You know what that's like. You're obviously, you've got your DPT, your physical therapist. You've worked through all those different phases of rehab and... If I remember, you are a CSCS, right? So certified strength and conditioning specialist. So you have the sports performance strength and conditioning coach side as well. I mean, you, you're, you're spanning the whole spectrum there, the whole gamut. It. That's why I did it. I mean, it just, make, it just <laughs> yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But so few, that's not very common to have all that, the athletic training yeah. certified and licensed, and then the, the PT and the CSCS. I mean, that's... I mean, you're, you're, you can see an athlete from literally the time they injure their ACL on the field or court all the way through to where they're, you know, back to high-level yeah. sports performance training. Right. I mean, no. it's... I've been very blessed. I'm very... Uh, yeah, I, that's exactly why I did it. And part of it, too, is that you, by doing that, by, by trying to sharpen the axe, so to speak, in all three of those disciplines, you really... The idea is the athlete help them the most. I don't know everything about... I, I work with some great strength coaches, know way more than I do. But at least if I could speak the language, you know, and, right. and about what lifts to do, what not to do, when we could do them, the modifications to make in the weight room, like you can mm-hmm. squat, we got to make this modification, right? Like, I believe that's helping the athlete ultimately, but also makes me better because I learned from them. Right. All right. Great. Well, uh, is there, are there any other points you'd like to make regarding ACL injuries that we haven't discussed? Any, anything else? Uh, I would say one would be that I, I get this a lot. Um, uh, my doctor cleared me. Okay, understand that if you're cleared, that's a medical clearance. Uh, people like myself physically clear you. Because a lot of times I have to say, um, well, did he watch you do anything? Like, you know, because sometimes, you know, he or she watched you do anything. A lot of times they didn't, right? right. So, uh, you know, remember we've been the ones jumping and running here, you know. Um, he or she didn't watch you do that, right? right? So there's a, there's a piece of that. Um, Try to eliminate the noise as much as possible. Careful with the, the Dr. Google searches and things because that can really cloud your mind with stuff. Um, you're ready when you're ready. Okay, that's yeah. a big thing. And I already mentioned about, you know, just trust the process. It takes right. time. Um, there's a reason why we have criteria-based stuff. Don't go on the calendar. Go on your criteria. And hopefully your rehabilitation professionals outline those nicely for you. Great. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Medical clearance versus being <laughs> cleared by Big somebody difference. that's actually we doing that all the time. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come in and talk oh, about ACL injuries today, Dr. Well, Lorenz. <laughs> yeah. Um, how can folks contact you if they have any questions or are in need of rehabilitation? Maybe they want to know about some research studies, just your general contact info. Uh, yeah, you'll find me uh, on LMH, LMH's website, lmh.org. You can probably find me on there. Um, uh, if you want to, I'm on Twitter at um, Casey Rehab Guy. Uh, if you're on there, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Just search for my name. Uh, and if you wanted to, you know, shoot me an email, uh, I'm at uh, uh, daniel.lorenz at lmh.org. All right. And uh, if you have any questions for me about the KU Exercise Science Program, Send me an email. Uh, it's jtaylor at ku.edu, or you can call me at 913-897-8516. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of Fitness Facts. Thanks for watching. Thank you.